Hello there. A pleasant day to all of you. Welcome to the Institute of Global Professionals Free International Webinar. Thank you for joining us this wonderful day. I hope that you will be able to stay with us until the end of the webinar. My lovely audience, I will be your host for this day. My name is Sabat, a proud teacher from Philippines. I am honored to be the host for today. I am proud to be associated with IDP as Global Volunteer. I am delighted to welcome all of you for the Institute of Global Professionals free webinar. Thank you for joining us today. And it is my humble request to all of you to stay with us till the end of the program, for I assure you that everyone will have many e-takeaways and payoffs for this webinar. From time to time, you may like and comment in this webinar. Don't forget to like, share, comment, and most especially, please tag your friends in the comment box. Let us watch together as we learn together. We believe that the power is gained by sharing knowledge and not by hoarding it. Once again, I am Marbet, a volunteer host from IDP Philippines. Every day, many new participants are joining us. So allow me to give you a little insight about IGP. The Institute of Global Professionals serve as student and community resources, providing holistic social work and education towards creating a proficient generation. IDP is a leading online skill development with thousands of learners worldwide. I am proud to inform you that IDP is internationally recognized and globally accredited. IDP is your trusted platform to learn new things from globally from global leading leaders. We provide webinars, trainings, offline and online courses with the best well-trained speakers and coaches from all over the world to, to cater you with best learning platform. We believe that is, it is not enough to increase one's knowledge by just acquiring formal education. So we, we provide effective training and consultation to generate proficient generation. Our mission is to empower and enhance people's skills through webinar. And did you know that we have already successfully completed 193 webinars at, as of yesterday with that? We expect that all are being benefited in their personal and professional life with all these webinars. And we wish you that you remain with us in this long journey. Let me remind you once again, don't forget to like, share, comment, and make sure to tag your friends in the comment box. Your comment encourages us to do better and give our best service to all of you. Good day, everyone. I am cordially welcoming you all. For today, we are presenting the webinar number 194 with the topic learning across areas of math, social studies, and assessment. For this session, we will have three dynamic speakers. Rosalind Pasido, Paul Mark Mohamed Amir Andres, and Joby A. Hinampas. Without further ado, let's start our program with the IGP mantra, Feed Your Skills. This mantra is anchored into three eyes, that is, inspire, innovate, and impact. At this juncture, I would like to call on screen our first speaker with her introduction. That's Good evening, everyone. I am Ms. Rosalind Dalam Patricio, a loving mother of three, namely Ice, Ira, and Inya, and a full Lala of one. My granddaughter Riri is my stress reliever. I graduated from Philippine Normal University with a degree of Bachelor of Science in Mathematics for Teachers under the Department of Science and Technology. I am also graduating from University of Perpetual Health, System Delta, for my graduate studies 
with a degree in Masters of Education, major in Mathematics. Currently, I am teaching Mathematics 9 at Talon Village National High School. I am also fortunate enough to be included in the pool of great and talented teacher tutors of the Department of Education, ETOLI's special program, Math Remediation. For 25 years of my teaching, mathematics is really a hard subject. Let me quote some observation from the following personalities. Math anxiety is an emotional reaction to mathematics based on a past unpleasant experience, which harms future learning. A good experience learning mathematics can overcome this past feelings, and success and future achievement in math can be attained, according to Ellen Friedman in 2017. A famous insight from W.B. Williams in 1988 is a reminder of how critical it is to pitch for understanding, making things as hands-on and real-world as possible. Tell me mathematics and I will forget. Show me mathematics and I may remember. Involve me and I will understand mathematics. If I understand mathematics, I will be less likely to have math anxiety. And if I become a teacher of mathematics, I can thus begin a cycle that will produce less math anxious students for generations to come. Foreigner in 99 also made this related observations. If math teachers do something about helping their students to develop their confidence and ability to do math, we can impact their lives in a positive way forever. Our students, career, and ultimately many of their decisions they will make in life could rest upon how we decide to teach math. We must make the difference for the future of our kids in an ever-growing high-tech, competitive, global world which depends so heavily on mathematics. The so-called new normal has brought so many nerve-wracking challenges, especially in the field of education. But thankfully, we educators have proved equal to the challenges, and we continue to do so, resilient as we are. A challenge by its very nature is a stimulating task. So stimulated have we been that we are facing this new learning with renewed confidence, a renewed sense of mission, not only for the youth, but for our country and the world as well. Education is the best weapon and shield for any pandemic in any form. We are so privileged as teachers to lead our students, even the parents, to a positive way of responding to this unprecedented crisis. I accept the challenge of helping make this learning truly engaging, essentially meaningful, and fun-filled for our learners. So sit back and relax as I show you different interactive activities or strategies in alleviating math anxiety. Remember, as I always say, hashtag happy love always. Good day and God bless everyone. Wow, you have very interesting topic today, Mom. We cannot wait to hear from you once again. Uh, let's give a warm welcome to Miss Rosaline Padicio. Please share your screen. Hello, Miss Rosaline. 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 Hello,
Okay, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. The floor is yours, ma'am. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. I'm Mrs. Rosaline Galang Padisha. I will be teaching you different interactive strategies in alleviating math anxiety. But before we do that, I'm going to leave a question before you proceed. So, I have here four triangles and two polygons, which are pentagon and quadrilateral. So, what I want you to do is to think about how you, go, you are going to fit all the four triangles on this pentagon or quadrilateral. This one is a, trape, uh, a trapezoid. So could you fit it in? Okay. So what is mathematical system? It has four major areas, which are higher arithmetic, algebra, geometry, and analysis. It, uh, it also has four parts, the undefined terms, defined terms, actions, and postulates, and theorems. This mathematical system in modern mathematics, we accept certain undefined terms. The choice on these terms are completely arbitrary and generally used to facilitate the development of structure for examples are point, line, number, variable, and the like. We define these terms based on the undefined terms. Examples are line segment, angle, triangle, quadrilaterals, circles, and the like. Early Greeks considered postulates as general truths. These are states statements assumed to be true without proof to all studies and actions are the truths relating to the special study at hand so how do we re relate mathematical system in real life for example if you are converting a recipe from metric to units like a teaspoon tablespoon or cup calculating cooking time for each item and adjusting accordingly. Finally, understanding ratios and proportions, particularly in baking. So for example, if the recipe needs one egg and two cups of flour, then the ratio of eggs to flour is one is to two. I'm going to teach you two online application or these are graphing calculators the first one yes can you hear me mom beth I hear you mom it's all right just proceed with your presentation okay the use of desmos in any mathematical system would be very beneficial for individuals who want to pursue careers in the world of ar architecture, animation, graphic designs, engineering, and the like. So what is desmos? Desmos is an advanced graphing calculator implemented as a web application and a mobile application written in JavaScript. It was founded by Ellie Luberoff, a math and physics double major from Yale University. In addition to graphing both equations and inequalities, it also features lists, plots, regressions, interactive variables, graph restriction, simultaneous graphing, piecewise function, polar function, graphing, two types of graphing grids, among other computational features commonly found in a programmable calculator. It can be also used in several different languages. So let me give you an idea of what you are going to see on the Desmos. So if you go on your web browser, then you type in www.desmos.com, this will be the interface of your calculator. 
doors. So you would see these are the interface of Desmos. Clicking on graphing calculator, you will be having the interface of Desmos. And then you can type anywhere on the input box. So when you click that setting, you can delete all the things that you had written on the input box. And you can make or show your grid, the X and Y axis, if you want to see the grid, the axis numbers, and the arrows. You can also add labels. And then regions and degrees can be used on this graphing calculator. You can also make it bigger or smaller in text or display. You can also zoom in and zoom out. So to look, to look at the graph bigger or smaller. So you can give emphasis on this. Then you have the keyboard. Wherein there is an alphanumeric, there are functions like trigonometry, statistics, distribution, and miscellaneous. So when you type on the input box, let's say, for example, you have the quadratic expression. So this is the standard quadratic expression. So if you want to to let your students see if they have a movement or a transformation of this quadratic, you just add one and the graph will move upward, one unit up. If you subtract one, the graph will move one unit down. If you write it as a square of binomial, for example, a sum of the square of binomial, you would notice that the original graph will move to the left. Now, if you have the difference of the square of binomial, so this is just like a, a cell phone or a calculator that you can erase, you can undo. So if you have the square of the difference of binomial, then the graph will move to the right. So this one, this calculator is very interactive. You can also use this in trigonometry. So if you want to find the value of tangent 45, it will give you the exact amount or the exact value of tangent. So no need to buy a basic calculator. But if you have internet connection, you have data, you can use this calculator online. Also, if you have still space on your calcul on your cell phone, you can download this application and you can use this application offline. So students can use this anytime they want. You can also hide all the graphs that you don't need to show in your class during your online class or your distant learning. Also in Desmos, they have the pre-equations graph. So you would see on the left side, when you click on the three bars, you will see the linear equation graph, the slope intercept form, point slope form, two point form, parabolas, in vertex form, in standard form, trigonometry, period and amplitude, polar rows. So there are so many graphs in store in Desmos graphing calculator. Even the transformation of functions, scaling, inverses, and the family of curves. Okay? So this one is a good application that we can teach our students in solving mathematics so they will not be having a hard time now you can undo or redo or delete whatever you had type on your input box you can also add table so if you want to plot points on your Cartesian plane 
All you have to do is to add the table and then type all the table values for each point or the ordered pair of points. And your students now will see where the point lies on the Cartesian plane. We can also add an image or a folder for your work. Okay. So let me now show you another interactive calculator. So this one is another graphing calculator that you can use online and offline. And it's called GeoGebra. So GeoGebra is an, the name is from a formant tool made from the two words geometry and algebra. It is an interactive geometry, algebra, statistics, and calculus application intended for learning and teaching mathematics and science from primary school to university level. These are the mathematical system that you can use with Hello, Mom Joby, are you still there? I think Mom Joby is having some difficulty with her internet connection. Could we just wait a while for her? But uh, as far as I could remember, she was talking about Desmos and also GeoGebra. I'm interested about GeoGebra, but Desmos is really very interesting. This is an interactive online calculator i think her presentation really helps me elevate my math anxiety <laughs> just wait a while for mom joey to connect again okay i think she is really having some difficulty but for the meantime let's proceed to it's Mom Rosaline, yes. Mom Rosaline is having internet problem. Mom Rosaline, are you still there? Could you connect? I think she's having problem with her internet. Let's just wait for a few more seconds. Um, for the meantime, I would like to remind everyone to please don't forget to like share and comment in our comment box and for and we will be giving also the e-certificate link later okay if you are if you will have problem okay you're back ma'am i think we had some problems with your connection okay could you share your screen again? Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Make it in the presentation mode. Okay.
Can you see my screen? Yes, it's um, it's the blue one. Okay. But I don't see any. Okay, that's it. It's good now. Okay, so let's proceed with Jay Jebra. Let's do our a work using Jay Jebra. So we are going to open your Jay Jebra application, and you may use your cell phone or desktop or laptop. So we are going to prove Pythagorean theorem using GeoGebra. So when you click on your web browser, www.geogebra.org, you will have the following. So you can explore your GeoGebra. You can have your own account in GeoGebra. And these are the people behind the classroom resources. You can also have live conversation with your class with interactive math tools. or the work that you had created it can be uploaded in their site so a while ago i showed you one activity that uses geogebra could i fit in so you can search so many resources in geogebra and you can do these activities So all of the mathematical system that I mentioned a while ago, you would see that it's also inputted in GeoGebra applications. So let's start with the interface of GeoGebra. So you have the Cartesian plane. You also have the input box. When you click on the algebra button, you have the input box. Then you can move around your graph or your Cartesian plane. You can make it bigger or smaller. You can also do something with your grid or axis. There are major grid lines, there are minor grid lines. So when you click on the wheel or the settings, okay. You can also zoom it out or zoom in, zoom in, zoom out for much bigger view of your graphing calculator. So let's say we try to input something. So you have the alphanumeric, you have the f of x or the function of x, you have the alphabets and the special characters. When you click on the basic tools, all of the things that you need to construct a shape, a solid, GeoGebra has it. And you can even transform your figure. You can also add table on your work using GeoGebra.
So let's now create or let us now prove that Pythagorean theorem really exists. So first, we need to have a segment. So you click on tools, then lines, and then segment. Then let's have a semicircle. Since a semicircle, when it is intercepted, if it's an intercepted arc, it will have a right angle. So the angle that it, it was intercepted or inscribed will measure right angle. Since Pythagorean theorem should have a right triangle to prove that it is really existing, We need to create a right triangle and segment BC, which contains the right angle. So you would notice that the semicircle now is not needed to be shown, so we can also hide that semicircle. So you now have a right triangle. So this time, we will be creating squares using the measurement of the sides of the right triangle so i'm going to create perpendicular lines on the hypotenuse and the legs of your right triangle also i can change colors on my right triangle if i want to emphasize it so choose the best color that you like or your favorite color. You can have the opacity and even the sides can be broken or solid. So I'm going to choose the opacity of this as set as 5 or 13 or 0. So it's up to you how you are going to present your right triangle. Now I'm going to create perpendicular lines so that my square will have the same measurement of sides with my hypotenuse. So I'm going to construct perpendicular line, then click on point A and the segment that is perpendicular to that line, also with B, and then I'm going to create a circle. You would notice I created the circle on the circumference of the first one. I can undo that if you want. Okay. So again, I'm going to make a, set, a circle with center wherein A to B or the measurement of your hypotenuse. Then I'm going to create or construct measurement of your hypotenuse. So as I'm creating it, you would notice that I am now beginning to have a square whose side is equal to the measurement of your hypotenuse. So I'm going to go to polygons, then click on point A, point D, point E, point E, point B, going back to point A, and now I have a square whose side has the same measurement of the hypotenuse of the right triangle so if you want to remove again the circles and other 
objects that you can see or shades on your figure, you can hide it by clicking the circle on the side on which you want to remove or hide. Then let's go back to tools. And we will be creating squares on the legs of your right triangle. So let's construct on the legs of segment AC. So click on the point and the segment which is perpendicular to the lines that I need to be creating a square. And then again, click on circle, circle with center, and then click on point C or point A to have the circle. And put a point on the circumference of your circle and one of the perpendicular lines. So I now have point F. Then I'm going to create a perpendicular line to, to line FB so that I will have the same measurement. And then name the point. So let's create or construct polygon again by clicking on polygons, then polygon. So make sure that your points are consecutive. So you will have now a square whose side has a measurement the same with your leg or your AC, segments AC or the side AC. And then again, we can hide all the unnecessary lines or circles that we don't need to be shown in our work. Then we can change the color by clicking on the area of the square. So we only we only need one square for the other leg. So we do the same procedure, construct perpendicular line, which is perpendicular to the leg of your right triangle. Then click on the point and the segment that you want to have perpendicular with. And then create a circle so that your square will have the same measurement with your leg of your right triangle so it's not it's not hard to construct now you would notice that you can construct your own figures in a cartesian plane wherein it's interactive that means your even your students can use this all together with you. You just share the link to them. So I'm going to create now the last square, which has the same side or measurement of the side with the measurement of the leg of your right triangle. And then I'm going to remove or hide the perpendicular lines and the circles. And I'm going to change again the color so I could give emphasis on the three different squares that I had created to show you and to prove to you that Pythagorean theorem really exists. So Pythagorean theorem tells us that the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of its legs. So you can show this to your students and they will analyze that when you combine the squares of the legs, you will have the square of the hypotenuse. So Pythagorean theorem really exists.
Okay. Did you enjoy it? Teachers? Students who are watching? So, when I started, I asked a question, if you could fit it, these four triangles to the pentagons and the trapezoid. So, how, how are you going to do this using J-Algebra? So I will just go to my GeoGebra and then explore some of the resources. And when I have it already, I will just type the activity that I want to show my students. And I am directed to the activity that I want to share with them. So this is how you are going to fit all the triangles on your pentagon and on your trapezoid. So all you have to do is to move the triangles and then find out how you are going to fit them all in your pentagon and trapezoid. So there is a circle, then you can just nudge it or move it around. You can do this together with your students. Even elementary students can enjoy this because they are able to have logical reasoning with shapes. So how are they going to fit this triangle on these polygons? So you just move around the triangles and you would notice they can and they will be able to fit the triangles inside the pentagon. So we now have the last piece. The triangle and it will move perfectly on your pentagon. So we already had fit in the triangles, the four triangles on our pentagon. Now, let's see if we can fit it in, in our trapezoid. So, move your triangles. Think about it, how you are going to place it on your trapezoid. Move it around by nudging the circle. So they will have a different way of looking at the triangle. So teachers, they will have a different way of fitting in the triangles on your trapezoid and your pentagon. So make sure that they are able to understand that even if you have different triangles and different polygons, all of which are interrelated with one another. Nudge the circle again and you can move around your triangles. You 
can arrange it properly so they would fit in properly. So as long as your students had the idea how they are going to fit all these triangles on the polygons that you had given, give them credit for that because they had taught well how they are going to fit these triangles on there, on the given trapezoid and pentagon. So these activities are very engaging, especially to our students who love visual solution for problems in mathematics. So not everything in math should be solving numbers. You can also do it in shapes. Since we have distance learning right now, we can use these applications to your students for them to understand polygons, triangles, and quadrilaterals in our level in grade 9. Okay? So these are my work when I tried to do this activity. So could I fit it in? And these are my answers. I am fit. So the four triangles are fit in in our pentagon and in our trapezoid. So I hope you learn some of the interactive strategies that I am using to alleviate math anxiety. As I always say, hashtag happy lang always. Good evening, everyone. That was a lovely presentation and lots of interesting suggestions about interactive online calculator, which will really help alleviate math anxiety. I believe that you were able to give interesting online math tools that will be useful for synchronous and asynchronous teaching and learning process in this new normal era. I believe that all the participants were able to get important e-takeaways. Thank you so much, ma'am, for those interesting ideas that you have shared to us. Then once again, you, I would like, yes, thank you, ma'am. Once again, I would like to remind our audience to please support us with your like, share, and comment. Make sure to tag your friends Nice. in the comment box and also you can make your own comment about a lesson that you have just learned we will be giving the e-certificate link in the comment box and if you face any problem collecting your e-certificate you can go directly to our website that is www.eduigp.com then after collecting your e-certificate please don't forget to celebrate with IDP with your check-in. Let us now proceed to our second speaker. He will be discussing to us about Verstein, a holistic approach in measurement and evaluation. Let's welcome with a short video, Sir Paul Mark Mohamed Amir Andres. Our facilitator of knowledge and wisdom for today, is an alumnus of Paranaque National High School, La Huerta, Annex. He obtained his bachelor's degree in general science with specialization in women's studies from the Philippine Normal University, Manila, as a scholar and as a dean's lister of his batch. He also obtained his certificate in teaching Spanish language and Islamic studies from the same institution. He finished his Master of Applied Theology with specialization in religious education 
in De La Salle University, Manila, and from the same institution, he also obtained a certificate in teaching religion. He also finished his studies in the field of advanced Christian spirituality in Fordham University, New York, and intensive Arabic reading in Sahih al Jamaami Institute. At present, he is studying PhD in Applied Theology with specialization in Religious Studies in De La Salle University, Manila and Master of Islamic Studies with specialization in Muslim Law in the University of the Philippines, Diliman. He is also currently a volunteer of the Silsila Dialogue Movement, a Third Order Carmelite, and a legal member of the Shin Buddhism sect in Japan. Last but not the least, He loves eating vegetables. Fellow educators, let us give a round of applause for our facilitator, Mr. Paul Mark C. Andres. Welcome, sir, Mark Paul Andres. That was awesome. I can't wait to hear from you tonight. Well, the audience is yours, sir. Um, hello po. Um, good evening. Um, may I know if my uh, presentation yes. is visible? Yes, we can see it now okay. and we can hear you clearly. Okay, so my topic for this day is about Verstenhen, a holistic approach in assessment, measurement, and evaluation. So before I begin with my topic, I would like to tell you a very short story. Okay, so... One day, there's an interaction between the teacher and the student. So some young children were asked by their teacher to list what they thought were the present seven wonders of the world. Though there were some disagreements, the following received the most votes. Um, for some students, um, for them, one of the wonders of this world is the Egypt's great pyramids. For the other, it's about the Taj Mahal. But for some, it is the Grand Canyon. For others, Panama Canal. And for the son of a lawyer, it is the Empire State Building. And for the other girl, it is the St. Peter's Basilica. And the last would be the China's Great Wall. However, you know, while gathering the votes, the teacher noticed that one student had not finished her paper yet. So... She asked the girl if she was having trouble with her list. The girl replied, Yes, a little. I couldn't quite make up my mind because there were so many. The teacher said, Well, tell us what you have and maybe we can help. The girl hesitated. Then read, I think the seven wonders of the world are. I think the seven wonders of the world are. Are number one to see the most beautiful things in this world. Number two is to hear the most beautiful song and music in this world. To touch and to taste the most delicious food in this world. To feel the warm and coldness. To laugh hard and to love. The room went so quiet that you could have heard a pin drop. There's a dilemma in the story, no? as an educator. The dilemma is about the expected outcome versus the insightful learnings. Earlier, the first topic is about mathematics. And technically speaking, mathematics is technically very rigid form of science. And it is quite easier to check the papers of the student because this is objective in nature. However, in the story, there are two problems. No? The first is there is expected outcome which is the answer of the first group of students and the insightful learning which is the answer of the um, last student if you were the teacher of that girl what is the grade of that girl that's the reason why we need to understand how can we assess measure and evaluate using an holistic approach and this approach can be used as a method in order to give a justifiable way of giving grades to the student. And for this, we will try to discover what is Westenhen or Prestenhen. 
So for the meantime, we will have a very short recap of what is the meaning of assessment, measurement, and evaluation. So I know everyone of you is familiar with this, so we will have a very short recap. So what is assessment? Um, educational assessment, notice that I use the word educational because there is a specific assessment which is quite closer to the concept of war. No? So our focus is the educational assessment. So it is a systematic process of documenting and using empirical data on the knowledge, skill, attitudes, and beliefs to refine programs and improve student learning. So technically, this is a systematic process, step-by-step -step process of documenting an empirical data, knowledge, skill, attitudes, and belief. So there's an element of belief in the formation of assessment. So it is not just objective, according to Allen. No? So the word assessment came into use in an educational context after the Second World War. So as I said earlier, um, the concept of assessment is quite old. No? So assessment is a systematic way of understanding the data and keeping it. So how about measurement? So measurement units is the quantification of attributes of an object or event, which can be used to compare with other objects or events. When you speak about measurement, what is the most important aspect of this is the concept of quantifying the attributes of an object. Because using this, we can measure it and we can um, put a specific empirical evidence on it. So in measurement, the keywords is only two words, the quant um, quantifiable aspect and the, specifically the tools that we will use. No? So the last um, aspect is evaluation. So evaluation is a systematic determination of an object's merit, worth, and significance using criteria governed by a set of standards. It can assist an organization, program, design, project, or any other intervention of initiative to assess any aim, um, realizable, concept, proposal, or any alternative to help in decision-making or to ascertain the degree of achievement or value in regard to the aim and objectives, the result of any such action that has been completed. So evaluation from its own etymology is focusing itself to the value of an process or an action. So the focus here is to find the value of a specific situation or program. So as we all know, um, this tree is the fund, um, foundation of education. No? This is one of the um, pivotal tenets of education. Um, using this aspect of measurement, evaluation, and assessment, we can say that this aspect of education is objective. However, because of these three tenets, our education system is more objective as usual. So because of these three, we encourage the educational system to promote a standardized test. So we need to become standardized in all aspects of our examinations. However, if we see this kind of aspect of education, um, we can see that there is a flaw in this kind of system. If you see the picture right now, no, uh, one of the, uh, of the teacher here uh, would instruct the students, which is the animals, um, to at least for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same examination. So please climb that tree. As we all know, um, this, is a, this is an example or presentation of a standardized test. However, if you look at the participants of that examination, this is not fair at all. Why? Because each of them has its own different um, strength and capabilities. If we look at some of the literature, we see that there's a concept of different um, strengths and weaknesses. No, So the problem here is, do you think um, our standardized test is effective? So that's the reason why we need to recheck our system right now. If the standardized, standardized test is effective in assessing or evaluating the performance of the student. So in order to check that, uh, I think we need to check also the another perspective in order to help us to fix that flaw. No? And one of the ways to check that flaw is the concept of First and hand, no. First and hand 
is a context of German philosophy, no, and in social sciences in general, has been used since the late 19th century in English as in, in German with a particular sense of the interpretative or participatory examination of social phenomena. So first and hand is a German term that means to understand, to perceive, to know, comprehend the nature and significance of a phenomena. So in sociology, it means systematic interpretive and, um, process of meaningful understanding. It refers to understanding the meaning of action from the actor's point of view. So what is important here is that we know the actor's point of view. So I think the picture would speak, no? What is the meaning of that? Um, I know how you feel. So I know exactly how you feel. If you know the feeling of a person, technically you understand it. Not just cognitively, but in the level of empathy. So in the interpretative sociology, first-hand sociology, according to Masonis, no? First-hand roughly translates to meaningful understanding or putting yourself in the shoes of others to see things from their perspective. Um, interpretative sociology differs from um, positivist sociologists in three ways. So number one, um, first and hand, it deals with the meaning of a uh, meaning attached to behavior, unlike positivist sociology, which focuses on action. Number two, it sees um, reality as being constructed by people, unlike positivist sociology, which sees an objective reality out there. And last, it relies on the qualitative data, unlike positivist sociology, which tends to make use of quantitative data. So what is the example of this? No? For example, number one, it deals with the meaning attached to behavior, unlike the positivist sociology, which focuses on the action. In our examination, no, in our assessment, um, if we use this um, kind of principle that it should um, Western hand should deals with the meaning attached to the behavior. Um, in the examination, um, the difference between behavior and action is that behavior is a consistent action. So examination per se is just an action. It is not a behavior. So if you judge a student based of um, based on his um, examination, I think this is just an action and this is problematic because this is not his behavior or her behavior. So the second one is it sees reality as being constructed by people unlike positivist sociology, which sees an objective reality out there. So the reality in this perspective in first hand is created by the people who experience it. So for example, in this picture, um, the other perspective would say that it is number six, but the other one would say that it is number nine. Both of them is correct. So it is like in an uh, no, earlier presentation in the mathematics, we can go and we can arrive at the same answer using different method. So we need to become sensitive to the needs of the student that sometimes even his or her method is different. We need to acknowledge it because perhaps we have the same perspective but different way of expressing it. So just because you're right does not mean I am wrong. You just haven't seen life of my side. So last is example no, number three, it relies on qualitative data unlike positivist sociology, which tends to make use of quantitative data. So in first hand, we can see that there is a space of expressing empathy and um, sympathy no, because the focus of this kind of approach is um, qual qualitative and not quantitative. So what is the importance of this and how can we connect it our own context no for example in the philippine context and um, this is connected to the concept of loob or kalooban refers to one's inner self or more specifically to the in, um, internal dimension of a person's identity its um, external counterpart is labas the physical outward appearance in the filipino context and culture um, we see the person not just its cognitive aspect but the holistic approach of the person for example and you can say that a person is good if internally and externally he is good. So it should be holistic in approach. And likewise, in the application of education in the Philippines, it should be also holistic in approach. We can say that the student is good because of the inner and outer characteristic of it. What is the difference of this law of and which is the inner part of the human person and the outer part of the inner uh, of the person? Uh, the inner part of the person, the Filipino context, cannot be measured by 
um, any measurement of the scientific approach. It cannot be measured because this is more on quality, the inner, no? Um, compared to its uh, counterpart, no, the labas, the uh, outer or outward appearance, it can be measured, no? In an empirical approach. So this is the holistic aspect of the Philippine culture of seeing human, no? Personhood. So this um, experience of the Filipino is not um, foreign no? in, in the Southeast Asia, in the Eastern um, experience, Eastern Asia. Why? Because in Asia, as we all know, um, Asia is the cradle of all religion. No? I mean, this is the, the law of the place of all the major, major religion of the world. And in the Eastern philosophy, even in education, we, we can see that the, um, the, the knowledge which is hidden in those religions are holistic in approach. For example, um, if you see in Buddhism, they have the concept of karuna, no compassion, which is a holistic approach of goodness. No? It is an action yet an ideology, no? compassion. There is an also, of, of course, in Islam, for example, in the surah, there's a concept of idina sirat al-mustaqin, no, to guide us to the straight path. The concept of guiding them is both spiritual and physical. No? And for example, in Christianity, there's a concept of agape, which is a concept of love, which is also holistic in approach, no? La, the concept and the action of love. So this practice of being holistic in approach and practice of sympathy is not foreign to our land no? in, the, in the Asian context. There's a reason why, no? Uh, what is the importance of this in education and Western hand? Um, remember that education per se, no? Uh, this is from the root word, I don't know, educare, no? In the mid-15th century, educaten, bring up children to train from Latin educatus, past participle of educare, bring up, rear, educate, source also of Italian educa um, educare, Spanish educar, French educare, uh, which is the frequentative of or otherwise related to educere, bring out, lead, forth, from X, out. Ducere, to lead, um, from the duke, to lead. So we can see that the foundation of the concept of education is holistic. Why? Because the focus here is to bring out, bring out what? The, pot, uh, the potential, full potential of the student. So there is, it is not, it should be holistic in approach and not cognitive in nature. So it should be holistic. So according to the Century Dictionary, you know, educare of a child is usually with reference to bodily nurture or support, while educare refers more frequently to the mind. And there is no authority for the common statement that the primary sense of education is to draw out or unfold the powers of the mind. Okay, so you can see the development, no? Um, from being holistic in approach and to become more um, mind-centered, no, we can see that this development is problematic. Why? Because originally, education should be holistic in approach, not just in the experience of the Western people, but also in the Western people. Because if you see at the original um, etymology of the word, we can see that it talks about the totality of the child not just a specific aspect of the child. So what is the effect of this no, in our educational system? All of our assessment, all of our um, evaluation and measurement should be culture-based. Now, I had this experience before uh, when I study in, I don't know, uh, Fordham University, New York, um, that the ex uh, I know the answer in the examination, but I cannot express my answer because it is not culturally um, sensitive to my culture, no? it is not sensitive. So our assessment should be culture-based. No? For example, if you are from a province, you need to create a specific assessment that is based on their culture. Second is it should be gender sensitive because as we all know, this is very pivotal in experiencing the world of the student. No? It should be also contextualized, no? contextual. It should be religious sensitive also. It should be inclusive in nature, social political sensitive, and the most important, it should show empathy. Um, these important elements of creating an assessment, evaluation, and uh, measurement should 
be followed in order to make a holistic approach of assessment. Um, empathy is very important and crucial in our situation today because, for example, we are in a pandemic and right now students are experiencing um, limi- I don't know, so many limitations because of the um, distance learning. Empathy is very important in that aspect in order to measure the true, true potentiality of the student. So in a nutshell, if we try to check it, um, there is this formula you know, of a holistic education. Uh, I don't write it as a holistic education, but education alone, because um, it is uh, redundant, no? because education should always be holistic in the first place. So assessment, measurement, and evaluation plus versed in hand should be education. Um, assessment, measurement, and evaluation is the objective part of education and the uh, first and head is the subjective part of education so we need to check our syllabus our learning plan our assessment um, tools if it has a dimension of objectivity and of um, the aspect of subjectivity so perhaps this is the reason why uh, we can see that the concept of I don't know, of teacher in the old, uh, one of the oldest language in the world, Sanskrit, um, they describe teacher as guru, no? Guru means the dispeller of darkness. Um, dispeller of darkness because it reflects the holistic um, responsibility of a teacher. It is not just dispeller of the mind, dispeller of the ignorance, dispeller of um, physicality, but it is the dispeller of darkness because darkness has so many forms to the extent that we can um, show and we can tell that a guru is someone who dispels everything that is negative to the student and to bring it up, edukare, to the full potential of the student. No? So guru, dispeller of darkness. No? So the, this concept of dispeller of darkness is very crucial in understanding ourselves as a teacher. So the... the for the last, I don't know, for the last slide, I would like to ask you if right now, if you are a holistic teacher, you no know, holistic teacher who can um, assess or evaluate his and her student in a holistic manner. So every one of us is called guru in the Sanskrit, and they are expected us to become the speller of darkness. So that's my last question. No, are you a holistic teacher? or just a teacher. So thank you for listening. So have a nice day. That was great. That was really great. And also for Mark, that was indeed jam-packed with information. We are so grateful for your marvelous presentation. This webinar is truly valuable for the audience because you shared a lot of interesting ideas about assessment, measurement, and evaluation in versed hand approach or view is it approach or view <laughs> um this is a philosophical view ma'am so technically ah, a, um, uh, however yeah. we can use it as an approach in assessment and evaluation yeah our uh something that my e takeaways today is looking things in a different perspective to bring out a holistic approach in education specifically in assessment that's what i have learned from you today thank you so much again again sir and we'll call you back in the question and answer portion once again i would like to remind all of you please support us with your like share and comment make sure to tag your friends in the comment box we will be giving the e-certificate link later and then if you face problem collecting your e-certificate just go directly to our website that is www.eduitgp.com then after collecting your e-certificate don't forget to celebrate with igp by check-in let once again let's give a round virtual applause to sell paul mark and dress and now it's time to move to our last speaker she will be discussing about new normal assessment in social studies. Let's welcome Mom Joby Hinampas.
Good day, everyone, and greetings from the Philippines. I am glad and grateful to be part of this international webinar through the Institute of Global Professionals. Thank you so much. It is my honor to impart some of my knowledge with regards to new normal assessment in social studies. By the way, I miss Joby A. Hinampas, social studies teacher here in Manila, wherein I have been teaching for almost nine years in both public and private junior high schools here. I also earned my bachelor's degree in secondary education, major in social studies at the Universidad de Manila, year 2011, graduated in my master's at the National Teachers College, major in social studies, year 2019, and currently taking my doctor's degree in educational leadership. Let's give another warm welcome to Mom Joby Hinampas. Mom, welcome to IGP. Hello, ma'am, and hello to the world. Good evening to everyone, and maybe good morning and good afternoon. So let me share my presentation. Yes, sure. Is it visible now, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. We can see it. Just... Okay, that's good. All right, so... Once again, thank you so much for having me here in the IGP, and I will be imparting you the new normal assessment in social studies. So for the subtopics, we have, of course, the assessment, the principles of assessment, the teaching, learning, and assessment process, inclusive assessment, some assessment methods, the quality criteria, rubric, and of course, the feedback. So as defined, assessment is an ongoing process of identifying, gathering, and organizing, and interpreting quantitative and qualitative information about what learners know and can do. So assessment is one of the sensitive topic or issue that we have, especially in education, that we are now in the transition from the conventional to the new normal. So we really need to be flexible. We really need to be resilient and adaptive to the things that is for the common good of education. Then we also need to be innovative in order for us to understand our learners and, of course, their level of understanding. So that's why we really, we really need to identify the, the identify the right assessment methods, and then we need to gather and organize the, the processes that our students have done in the entire learning, uh, entire teaching and learning process and interpret it in the quantitative and qualitative information. So the quantitative aspect here pertains to the numbers or statistical data based on the product or scores of performance of our students. Then from the qualitative aspect, this one was already mentioned and discussed by the previous um, speaker in a way that there are abstract things that students have learned in the whole process of learning such as their communication skills their their interpersonal skills the compassion and kindness that develop in the learning process that's why we really need to assess our students especially in the times that we are now in the different learning modalities all right so that's it for assessment then next as you can see, we have here different types of assessment, the pre-test, the formative assessment, and the summative assessment. 
Okay, for the pretest, it is a it is an assessment that is used to collect information about our students. So, like the diagnostic assessment and uh, entrance exams that we have in college or in even in our junior high school days. So, it is conducted before a lesson or unit of study, and of course. It aims to determine the readiness level of our students and to inform instruction, as well as for them to have the overview or the scope of the lesson. Then below, I included some of the suggested face-to-face -face and online uh, learning assessment activities or tools. So before, okay, before we have the anticipation journals, the concept maps, surveys, I know that you are all familiar with these the picture interpretation, the KWL, no one to learn, and the rest of the organizers, short quizzes, student interviews, and open-ended questioning. But now, through the aid of technology, we, we set that into, a, into the new avenue of learning, such as the use of different applications and communication platforms. So as an example, so we have here the flip grid an interactive video discussion, the gym kit, the Google Classroom, the Google Forms, the Jamboard that serve as a whiteboard, then the Kahoot, the Mentimeter, and I know you already you also have some applications in mind that you are using in the pre-assessment of your classes. Okay, for the formative assessment, it is also known as the assessment for learning in a way that it is ongoing. No, it is procedural. It is the process. The assessment as learning wherein it actively involves our learners in the learning process. So, okay, assessment or this kind of assessment gathers information about student learning. Then it is conducted during a lesson or unit of activity. And the aim is to track our students' progress and to make changes to instructions. So some of the examples during our face-to-face -face before are the following, the checklist, the choral response, the conferences, the demonstrations, discussions, individual whiteboards, observations, portfolios that serve as the repertoire of our students' understanding outputs and achievements, the progress report, short regular quizzes. Below, as you can see and observe, it is almost similar to the online assessment activities and tools that I have in the pre-assessment, meaning these tools can be also utilized in both pre-assessment and formative assessment, but vary based on their in intentions and purpose of its use. Then lastly, we have the summative assessment. Summative assessment or the assessment of learning. This kind of assessment is a grade-based one in a way that we need to show what students have learned based on the result of the whole assessment process. Okay, so it is used at the end of a lesson or the unit of study. And then it is also to provide evidence of what students have learned. Okay, and then here are some of the examples. The standardized testing, the hands-on performance task, the group project, and some of the authentic assessments that we have. And then below for the online is the use of rubrics, but actually we are still we are um, using it before no? in our face to face. And then the speed grader, this pertains to the app that we can use in grading our students based on a based on a certain criteria, the documentaries, the vlogs, some project proposals, and even business proposals. So there are a lot of platforms, a lot of communication and educational platforms that can be utilized now in order to have a, an authentic and worthy assessment for our students. Then I also included here some sample techniques for each formative assessment strategy. 
So the following strategies are establishing clear learning target and success criteria. Of course, before we have our teaching and learning endeavor, we have to have goals and terminal goal. Okay? We have to have the end in mind. Eliciting useful evidence of learning. Providing effect, effective feedback, okay, which can be an oral feedback, a descriptive feedback. Um, it can also, we can also have the peer assessment as way of feedback and the self-assessment for the self-reflection of the learner. Then engaging learners in assessing and improving each other's work, like the peer assessment that I mentioned earlier, and increasing learners' ownership of their own learning. So this one pertains to the metacognition or the, the, the reflection of the students about her or his learning. Then the next slide shows us the sample summative assessment tools that qualify as performance tasks in various learning delivery modalities. Since in this trying times of pandemic, we have a different uh, delivery, learning delivery modalities such as the blended learning, the online distance learning, the TV-based and radio-based, and the rest of the modalities that will suit and fit to the needs and interests of our learners and of, of course of the schools as well. So for the face-to-face -face learning, we have the following, okay? So for the written outputs, we have still here the, the maps, the essays, the journals, news writing, especially in the social studies that we need to make our students aware of the current events that we have the reaction or reflection paper with regards to some phenomena or social concerns or problems that we are encountering now. And then for the products, we have the collage, the diorama making, the leaflet, poster, and slogan that we can transfer in an online scenario through the use of uh, an educational platform such as uh, educational and even communication platforms such as the Canva, the map construction, the research work, timelines, film documentaries, review analysis, and advocacy. Then for the performance tasks, okay, so we have here the community involvement, the debate, the interviews, the issue awareness, news reporting, presentations, role plays, and some simulations. And then as you gleaned it and you compared, okay, so we, in the performance task, task column, okay, we can see now the different learning communication platforms such as the Zoom and Google, and even the StreamYard, the YouTube that we are using in our online classes. Okay, so these are the summative assessment tools that we can use in our teaching and learning process. For the principles of assessment, of course, having the idea about the nature of assessment, we should also be informed with its principles. So the first principles said or states that assessment must be aligned with the curriculum. So this first principle underscores the role of the learning competency, the, the role of the content and performance standards. So the tree will serve as the framework or set the direction of the teaching and learning process. Then for principle number two, assessment must be valid. So but validity here pertains to the accuracy of the assessment that is used in the teaching and learning process or in the learning process of our students. So validity ensures that the assessment criteria and competencies and the rest of the activities accurately measures the, the required or the developed competencies of our students. So meaning we have to align our assessment to the competencies that we have. And of course, in the previous, in the previous 
content and performance standards. Then for principle number three, it states that assessment must be reliable and consistent. So this pertains to the consistency of our assessment, wherein assessment is expected to produce a comparable outcome and, of course, with a consistent criteria over time and by the different learners and even examiners. And for the principle number four, it states here that assessment must be fair and inclusive. So this highlights the, the, the term equality, you know, that we should disregard we should disregard the background or the diversity that we have, the race, the ethnicity, the ethnicity, the color, the religion, and the rest of the aspect that may serve as hindrance to education. It is also in a way that we adhere to the United Nations Development Goals of Education for All and Quality Basic Education. So everyone, especially the young ones, should have an access to quality education. Then for principle number five, it states here that assessment must be manageable for both learners and teachers. So meaning the assessment should not be a burden to the both parties, that the assessment should be based on the capacity and capabilities of our learners, as well as the time for them to accomplish the, as the activities or the tasks that we are giving, giving to them. Then for principle number six, assessment must give learners range of ways to demonstrate their achievements. So this pertains to the opportunity for our students to demonstrate their capabilities, their talents in the best way that they can. So we should also consider the interests of our learners and their preferences in portraying and showcasing their their projects or their performances. Then for, the, for principle number seven, it states here that assessment must be a part of a transparent ongoing process where learners progress is monitored over time. So I will highlight here the word transparent in a way that we should, oh, we should inform our learners that they, were, they are being assessed that they are being measured and evaluated. Then for the last principle, teachers and learners must use effective feedback to improve learning and reflect on the teaching and learning process. Okay, the, the main or the major important words here are the words feedback and reflect in a way that feedback is necessary for the students to determine the rooms for improvement to the things that what went well, and for them to reflect on the task or the performance they have done. In addition, it's the teaching and learning process or the teaching, learning, and assessment process. So the first process here states that we need to identify the curriculum standards. So this curriculum standards is unanimous to the principle number one that we have discussed earlier. It pertains to the learning competencies, the content standards, and the performance standards in a certain curriculum or subject. Then for the second one, is to develop the assessment criteria that is aligned, of course, to the curriculum standards. Then we have to identify the assessment methods. What assessment methods will suit to our learners? Is it that through observation, through validating and evaluating their projects and, and tangible activities, or through a test or standardized test? Then next is to design the, the assessment activities. So after identifying accurate assessment methods, it's now time for us to, to craft our own assessment in a way that we are personalizing the assessment that will fit to the needs and interests of our learners, learners including the consideration of the time, the finances, 
and the rest of the constraints that may hamper the assessment process. Then, next is to develop, to develop and undertake teaching assess, and assessment activities. So this pertains to the significance of planning a student-centered activities that can be seen or is aligned to the curriculum standards. And of course, we should also give time for our students to consolidate the new knowledge and practice the new skills. Then for the next one, is to record evidence of learning. That's why we really need to have also the different assessment tools, okay, for us to have a evidence or proof of the learner's progress and, of course, to track their progress in the learning process. Next is to make consistent judgment about learning in a way that we are giving constructive judgment and then is to give immediate feedback. So feedback should be given right after the lesson or an activity for the students to know the strengths and weaknesses of the things that they have done in the process. So whether it's a performance task or a project-based assessment. Then is to use assessment information to review your teaching. So this one is the most fundamental um, area in the assessment wherein our in wherein modifying our today's assessment means improving the instruction of tomorrow so in this sense we are really progressing or improving the teaching and learning process then the next topic pertains to the inclusive assessment wherein inclusiveness pertains to the equality wherein everyone especially the learners in needs should be included in the teaching and learning process. So based on the text here, inclusive assessment refers to the design and use of fair and effective assessment methods and practices that enable all, all students to demonstrate to their full potential what they know, understand, and can do. So we are disregarding their orientation, the diversity that we have, our political views, our religious views, the race, the skin color. And then of course we also we also need to consider the the different learning delivery modalities that we have now that will suit the needs, the capability and the capacity of our learners and the institutions as well. And of course to accept the the unique characteristics of our learners and then according to an uh, according to the convention on the rights of person with disabilities article 24.2 b it states here that person with disabilities can access an inclusive quality in free primary education and secondary education on an equal basis with others in the communities in which they live. So everyone should have an access to education, even, even you have a disability or not, or unfortunate or not in terms of the socioeconomic conditions that we have, okay? And of course, it also relates to the learners with special needs. Then next one is the assessment methods. So we have here the different assessment methods. It can be either talking to learners, wherein the teachers talk to and question learners to gain insights on their understanding and progress and to clarify their thinking. So it can be an oral or formal or an informal talk with the learners, or it can also be the post-conference after the activity or an activity. Next is the analysis of learners' product. Teachers judge the quality of products created by learners according to agreed-upon criteria. So this agreed-upon criteria pertains to the rubrics that we will use in order to have a valid and reliable assessment. And finally, we have here the test. 
wherein the teachers set quizzes to determine learners' ability to demonstrate mastery of a skill or knowledge and understanding of content. So these are the assessment methods that we can utilize in various ways. Then we also have the quality criteria of assessment that if that pertains to the validity, reliability, and clarity of the criteria that we have. Okay, we should ensure that the instructions and the related competencies were included and considered in crafting the criteria. So when deciding on the assessment method to use, consider the following questions. What are you assessing, knowledge, skills, or both? Which assessment methods would best allow your learners to demonstrate what they have learned? And which method would make it easy for you to gather evidence of your learner's progress over time. So this is what I mentioned earlier, that assessment should be manageable in, the, in both parties, to the learners and to the teachers as well. And for the recording methods, we have here some of the examples. So we have the class checklist, a list of students' activities or performance, the class record wherein we are putting the, the, the scores of the students or the related equivalent scores of the students based on the tasks that they have. The digital portfolios that serve as the e-repertoire of students' outputs. Then we have the visual and audio records and the scorecard. Okay, the scorecard that is used in the alter, alternative assessment. And then here are some of the examples of assessment activities and its recording methods. For observation, we have the investigative activities, role play, oral presentations, dances, musical performances, skill dem skills demonstration, group activities, debate, monitoring, and motor and psychomotor games, simulation activities, and science experiments. Of course, we are we will not do this uh, do this all. No, we we are just selecting few that it, that will suit to the needs and interests of our students and the alignment of the activities to our learning competencies. And then for the recording methods, we have the anecdotal records, the class checklist, the grids, and the audio recording photographs. For the analysis of learners' products, we have here the worksheets, the essays, the concept maps, the projects, models, artworks, multimedia presentations, and the products made in technical vocational learning areas. So... Um, what is added here is the portfolio. And then we have also here the photographs and teachers' comments. For the talking to, to learners or conferencing, we have the hands-on math activities, the written work and essays, picture analysis, discussion using the comic strips, that we are fortunate in this time that we, ha we have the aid of technology for the improvement of these all activities, the story trace, the panel discussions, interviews, the team pair share, activities, and reading. So we still have here the checklist, the class read, and anecdotal records. And then for the test, we have the skill performance test, the practicum, the the things that we know before, the pen and paper, the pre and post test, diagnostic and oral. So for the rubrics, so why are we using rubrics? So these are the three questions that is important for us in using the rubrics. So what do we want learners to know and be able to do? How well do we want learners to know and be able to apply or use a skill in a concept and how will teachers and other scorers know when a learners know a concept and thus an activity well so what are the advantages of using rubrics first is that allows assessment to be more objective and consistent because the criteria are in specific terms 
then it clearly show learners how their work will be evaluated and what they can expect from this since it is specific and has a, a clear established criteria based on the competencies that we have in our subject or curriculum. Then promote learners' awareness, awareness of the criteria to use in assessing their peers' performance. Of course, we have to inform our students with regards to the criteria and measures that they will be evaluated with. Next is to provide useful feedback regarding the effectiveness of instruction. So again, feedback should be constructive in nature in, in a way that we motivate our students to do their best and to perform their best in any endeavor. On feedback, on the other hand, research shows that one of the most influential factors in improving learning is for learners to receive clear and specific feedback while they are learning. Teachers use the assessment criteria and evidence from completed record sheets to give learners immediate and explicit feedback. So definitely feedback will help our students to improve on their performance and improve the quality of learning that they have. So, for, so here are the techniques that can be utilized in our respective curriculum and even, of course, in social studies for oral feedback is to give interactive feedback by talking with the individual learner about his or her performance. Give class feedback by giving details of common strength of areas for improvement. Okay, so aside from the strength, of course, the rooms for improvement. If the issues is how to perform a certain skill, we should explain or model it again and give examples in a way that we are giving corrective measures and samples for our students. Provide informal coaching as you walk around and observe learners at work. Then for the written feedback, we should give descriptive feedback related to the assessment criteria. Use words that describe what is done well in the work. So we should give a positive affirmation to our learners. Use words to suggest improvement and say how to improve. So these are the suggestions with regards to written feedback. Then for peer assessment feedback, okay, so here are the following. We should ask, does the work or performance meet the criteria? What was done well? What can be done to improve the work or performance? And this can be done through the aid and use of rubrics. Then for the self-assessment feedback, Explain the assessment criteria so learners clearly understand the skills or knowledge. Help learners compare their work with the assessment criteria. Uh, this one pertains to the, the norm reference assessment wherein we are comparing the individual performance of the students to their peers that is usually in the national standard. Help learners to use checklists or sentence beginnings to judge their own work and then to teach learners how to be explicit in their self-assessment comments. So here are the techniques that we can use in our teaching and learning process. And lastly, so we have here the guidelines on giving effective feedback. So give feedback as soon as possible right after an assessment activity. Provide specific oral or written constructive feedback directly related to a learner's performance in a way that our students get motivated to perform well and improve their performances. Provide feedback that identifies learner's strengths highlights area for improvement, help learners give feedback to their peers using assessment criteria and rubrics during peer assessment activities, and finally, to provide learners with opportunities for self-reflection in self-assessment activities. Okay, so as a whole, assessment should, be, should have a positive impact on the teaching and learning process and to the whole education aspect 
that we have nowadays. So with that, thank you so much and good day to everyone. Hello, ma'am. Hello, ma'am Beth. That was truly really enlightening and inspiring insights about assessment that could be applied in the new normal modalities, particularly in social studies. But I think that could also be utilized in, adding, in other learning areas as well. You also discuss about, yeah. Uh, you also discuss about learning online learning tools that can be used in the assessment, the principles of assessment, teaching, learning, and assessment processes. Thank you for sharing your pearls of wisdom, Mom Joby. Thank you for your contribution and thank you for spending your precious time with us. Your sharing about assessment will surely be helpful to our audience because you have shared lots of new ideas. No doubt our viewers definitely gain awareness about the topic assessment. Once again, our deepest gratitude to you, Mom Joby Hinampas. And then I would like to remind once again the audience to, that we will be giving the e-certificate link in the comment box later. But once again, please don't forget to like, share, comment, and tag your friends in the comment box. Our e-certificate, if you... If you got problem collecting the e-certificate later, you can go directly to our website that is www.eduaigp.com. And after collecting your e-certificate, don't forget to celebrate with IGP with your check-in. Thank you so much to our three speakers for tonight. You will be back later in the Q&A portion. Then at this time, we will proceed to the quiz competition. After the quiz competition will be the question and answer portion. But before moving to our quiz competition, once again, I want to remind everyone, please support us with your like, share, and comment. Don't forget to tag your friends too in the comment box. We will be giving the e-certificate link in the comment box, as I have said a while ago. Uh, or you could go directly to the to our website that is www.eduigp.com. Then, of course, after collecting your e-certificate, don't forget to celebrate with IGP by check-in. Now, I would like to encourage everyone to join our quiz competition at slido.com. Okay, or you may just click the link in the comment box. Then our code is IGP quiz, all capital letter. Top 10 will be awarded with quiz competition, quiz completion certificate. Guys, come on, join the quiz competition. I could already see lots of participants joining. Okay, we have 101 participants as of this moment. And 102. Numbers are increasing. 
those will be fun and enjoyable. I also, I usually join the co quiz competitions. Then again, the top 10 will receive quiz competition certificate right away. The quiz competition link is already posted in the comment section. That is slido.com. And the quiz code is IGP quiz in capital letters. We are now 102 as of the moment. Then I'm sure there are still lots of people, lots of audience still entering the quiz. Are you ready, guys? Get ready now. We are now up to 131 participants. In our quiz competition, Again, that is www.slido.com and the code is IGP quiz in all capital letters. After the quiz competition, we will have the Q&A part. And then I will be giving you the step-by-step -step process in getting your e-certificate later on. That will be later on. Okay, now we have our first question. Is Desmos created by Ellie Buendia? Is that yes or no? The correct answer is no, and only 48% get the correct answer. Get ready for the next question. The cell Gabandong is on the top one. Mathematical system can be applied in real life situation. Is that true or false? And the correct answer is true that everybody got the correct answer. This cell is still leading the board. Graphic artist uses GeoGebra in creating basic shapes with animation. Yes or no? The correct answer is yes. 86% got the correct answer. And Dennis is now leading the board. Measurement is the only is only is the only necessary in any educational evaluation. Is it true or false? And the correct answer is false. 79% got the correct answer. John Paul is leading the board this time. Measurement is the quantification of attributes. Is that true or false?
the correct answer is true. And 92% get the correct answer. John Paul is leading the board once again. Evaluation is the same with measurement. Is it true or false? And the correct answer is false. 51% get the correct answer. John Paul is still leading the board. Evaluation can assist an organization, program, design, protect, or any other intervention or initiative to assess any aim, realization, concept and proposal is it true or false the correct answer is true john paul is still leading the board learners need time to proceed to process new knowledge and practice new skills this means that assessment should be developed and be implemented at the appropriate time in the learning process. This means that assessment must be used in manageable both, for, the correct answer is manageable for both learners and teachers. Okay, we still have Champo. Teachers need to Use range of assessment methods and activities to give learners a chance to demonstrate their learning in a specific topic. This mean, means that assessment must be must give learners a variety of ways to demonstrate their achievements or use feedback effectively to improve learning. And the correct answer is give learners variety. Okay, and then... Uh, Elias is now leading the board. Next is John Paul. And our next question. This is this principle requires that clear and consistent process be followed in developing assessment activities, reliability and consistency or validity assessment. The correct answer is re reliability and consistency. And then Elias is leading the board. Congratulations to our top 10 winners for today's quiz competition. Later on, we will be moving into our Q&A portion. And here are the top 10 winners. Dal Diaz, Australia, Tika Ram Ash Shama, uh, John Juan Miguel de Luna, Ian Chaik Manalo, Paul Vincent Manalo, John Paul de Laura, Princess May Dennis Quinto, and then Aria Geriguez, and I couldn't see the name of the last one. Top 10 is Carmela Chian. Okay, those are our top 10 winners for our co quiz competition for this day. Congratulations to all of you. Okay, we will be giving you the e certificate later. Congratulations to the quiz competition winners. We will now move on to our question and answer part of this program. Once again, let us welcome back our three speakers for today's webinar. Rosaline G. Padisho, Paul Mark.
Okay, welcome back to our three speakers. Ma'am Rosaline Padicio, yeah, yeah, Sir Paul Mark Andres, and Joby Hinampas. Are you ready for the questions? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Contest, okay. <laughs> yeah. You, to our audience, you may start sending your questions now. And then, please address the person that you want to answer your question. Don't forget to address the speaker whom you want to answer your question. For our first question, we have from Rosebella Malo. To speaker number one, how to use mathematics in our life, especially in time of COVID-19? How, how to apply it in our daily life? Okay. So, how are we going to apply mathematics in our life, especially in this time of COVID-19? Since I'm teaching mathematics online with my students, what I do is I give real-life situations like, for example, how I'm going to represent a parabola to them without really uh, going somewhere outside our home. So, for example, the parabola is just a representation of a letter U. This is the graph of a quadratic equation. So, I told them that even in our faces, there is a parabola. So, from our cheeks going to down to their chins, there is a letter U. And it is a representation of a parabola. Since it's covid and we cannot go outside, we can show them that there are mathematics everywhere, even in ourselves. So how do you apply it in our everyday life? They can use a graph to show the ups and downs of the cases in COVID-19 by just showing their teachers their graph using the Desmos and GeoGebra. Okay, that was interesting. <laughs> Do we have our next question? Okay, we only have one question. Let's see. Next, our next question is from Miss Lumahag to Mom Rosaline. What advice can you give to those students who are struggling in mathematics? By the way, I'm one of them. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that question, Mikaela. Since I know a lot of our students are having a hard time with numbers, especially in mathematics, I always advise them that don't make the numbers be your problem. Just stay focused on how you are going to solve this with the different methods that we are teaching you. If there are uh, different methods that being taught to you and there are long methods and sh short method use the method that you are comfortable with so just be happy solving numbers don't be stressed out with this these are just numbers okay <laughs> very interesting so let numbers uh, we should not be uh, afraid, of, be afraid numbers. of numbers. Yes. <laughs> From Rhea Kenyo to Mom Jovi, in assessment, of oh, yeah. in assessment of student, is it harder to assess them now in, during the, this pandemic era than the pre-COVID time? Okay. Hello. Good evening. Uh, good day to everyone. Actually, it depends on the in the scenario, it depends on the capability and capacity of our learner and, of course, the tools that we are using now. What is important is that we are innovative enough. You know, we have enough technology for us to be aided with our instruction and assessment as well. Thank you. Okay, the keywords there is being innovative during this pandemic time to assess our learners okay do we still have our next question is my my from my my does 
to speaker number one, I was so impressed by your presentation about GeoGebra. Me too, actually. Is GeoGebra will only be used in math? Mom Jovi? Uh, no, Mom Rosalyn. Hello, Mom Rosalyn? I think she's having problem. Any one of you would like to answer? Okay, actually, Jaya Jabber is very interesting. When Mom Jovi, Mom Rosalyn uh, presented that a while ago, um, I was also impressed, just like you, my mind. <laughs> uh, Jaya Jabber will only be used in mathematics. I'm not quite sure if it could be used, but since it is, I think it, it is only about mathematics since it is an online platform in math. So I think it could only be utilized in math subjects. But we could use it in somehow if we were going to explore it. We could also probably use it in other subjects in plotting things. Okay, next we have Rose Bella Malo. Two speakers, number two and number three. Uh, there's a study that reveals that cheating is one of the observable, is, is one observable, especially an online test. What would be the appropriate method of assessment and evaluation to minimize this problem? Speaker number one, Sir John. Sir Paul Mark. Hey, hello. Um, um, I think that's the role of Western Han because cheating is only visible in objective um, kind of standardized standardized test but it will if you will use um something that is qualitative in nature i think it is quite hard to i don't know to cheat because it is more on self-reflective and more moral and values based and another is when you speak about first and hand um it is an assessment that is more sensitive to its culture and its uh, moral, uh, I don't know, moral aspect. So I think it is quite hard to cheat in that kind of um, examination. So unlike with the objective aspect, you know, so objective examination is um, very prone to cheating. So yun po. Yes, thank you, sir. Paul Mark. Ma'am Jovi, would you like to add something about that? Okay, I also agree with what sir Pastor have mentioned, and we we should also use the quality in assessment, or in we should not uh, create a, a test or an assessment that can be seen in the Google or can be browsed in the internet. Then, of course, we we should also inculcate the ethics to our students. That, despite of pandemic, it is not the way for them to cheat or to do something that is very displeasing to the education process that's it okay do we still have questions let's see if we have another question okay next question is from marian rodriguez to mom jovi what are the best activities written activities in social studies to assess our learners so there are various activities for that written task, but I think that one that I find appropriate for me as a social studies teacher is the the way that I use my students to have their journal, wherein they jot down all the learnings, all the insights, and even their feelings with regards to our topic. And of course, on how they will apply what they have learned in the real life scenario. So that is one of the best. Okay, thank you for that answer, Mom Jovi. Okay, do we have more questions? Let's see. From Lamberto P Pilatan, Sir Paul, why is it that your present education is geared in the development in the development of holistic learner 
Um, I think um, we are in the 21st century education, no? Um, I think it is gone that our educational system is that the teacher is the sage of the stage. It is not the, the teacher is not the sage of the stage anymore, but student-centered, no? And when you speak about student-centeredness, um, it is holistic in approach. We need to bring out the full potential of the student in a holistic manner. And I think this is, it is not my choice, but it is the choice of um, the philosophy that we choose, you know, the paradigm shift of the 21st century. So technically, um, it is the choice of the experts in the education, holistic approach. Ayun po. Okay, thank you, sir. From Elmar Moralde. To all our three speakers, does assessment needs to be time-bound? Will it be reliable? Does it make sense to associate time in assessment? Does it make sense to associate time in assessment? Okay, let me answer first the, the first question. Does assessment needs to be time-bound? Yes or no? Yes, it should be. So that uh, students will have focus in answering their assessment. No, if you are going to have performance tasks, make sure that the students will be able to do their assessment or their tasks in their uh, facing, in their own time. But you can see an output that has an understanding on their lesson. If you are going to give them uh, minimal time to do their performance tasks, you will have an output which will not be based on your criteria or your rubric. As long as they are able to present to you their understanding on the lesson, I think we can just give considerations on our students. I think Sir Paul uh, Mark? Uh, yes. Oh, um, yes. I, you don't, sir. Okay. Just go on, sir. Um, okay, we have our next question. This is Sir Paul. How okay, can this we... is... Hmm. Yeah, go on. Oh, sorry, and um, this is a very nice mm -hmm. question. No? Um, how can we incorporate the, no, no, the Western hand in math, science, and languages? I think in, it is very important to use the rubrics, no, which is the, presented by the third um, presenter. And we can include it um, using the value system. No, uh, I think we need to see also or include the effort of the student, the values of the student, how it was prepared. Um, and last would be the potential of the work of the student. Because if we focus on the output of the student itself without its effort and its intention and the background of the student, no, um, it would be problematic and unfair, for example. Um, if you have a poor student and a rich student, and you obviously the rich student has the capacity to submit a very beautiful project. However, if you see the um, alternative um, alternative project with the poor student, but with the same objective, no, I think you can give any special um, form of I don't know um, rubric for that. So I think um, as a teacher, we, we are have the capacity to create our own techniques in order to incorporate um, first and hand or subjectivity in our rubrics. So yun po yung, that's my first perspective for that specific question. Okay, thank you, sir. And then from Lamberto Pilat, and again, Ma'am Jovi, what is the best way of assessing learners' authentic performance in modular distance learning and why? Actually, the best assessment for that, I think, is to assess the cares need of the learners that is based also in the learning competencies, the performance, and content standards. So one of the most important to consider is the the assessment or the activities is is also applicable to the students. Now they have the interest too in conducting the task and they are motivated to do that task. Okay, so we are guided by the competencies, by the rubrics, and most of all, the students have fun in learning. Thank you so much. 
Okay, that concludes our question and answer portion for today to our three speakers. Thank you for your marvelous responses for the queries of our dear audience. I am sure that all are satisfied with your answers since all questions are verbal answer. Thank you again. Thank you so much to all of you. Mom Rosaline, Sarah Paul, Mark, and Mom Jovi. We will now proceed to the announcement. Okay, we have a free international webinar daily with a fixed time, 6 p.m. BST and UTC plus six. Double bonus with, with regular webinars along with our regular, regular webinars. We also have added webinars on every weekend, Sunday morning and at the month of September. September morning session date is on October 26. That is 9.30 a.m. BSC. That is our double bonus. And then we also have our triple bonus. From October, we will start our webinar series program. You will get individual certificate for each webinar. And after submitting all certificates, you will receive a webinar series, series certificate loading. Highly focused, this will be highly focused on teaching strategies, research, assessment, pedagogy, tools and techniques, professional development, and also communication skills. That is our triple bonus here in IGP. Our first webinar series program has five parts. Webinar series topic is about authentic assessment in teaching and learning. Part one will be in October 1. Part two is October 4. Part three is October 7. Part four is October 10. And the last part will be on October 26. Our second webinar series program has four, four parts webinar series. The topic will be teaching English as foreign language and assessment. Part one is October 2, part two is October 6, part three is October 20, and part four is October 24. That is our second webinar series. And our third webinar series program has five parts webinar series. Topic is Digital Classroom Engagement Tools. Part one is October 12, part two uh, part one is will be on October 11. Part two will be on October 12. Part three is on October 13. Part four is October 14. And part five is on October 15. That is our third webinar series, Diploma Certificate Announcement. Congratulations to all. It's a great journey, one year long. That's amazing. You set priority. Learning with IGP, we receive youth application, but based on all activities, we awarded 708 participants with their one-year international diploma on professional development and management. Celebration time with, with your new achievement. Congratulations to those who, those who received their diploma certificate already. Download instruction. Click on, on any photo. Click next with side, sidebar. Find yours. If not, check next page. Every page, we include 80 certificates. Download from desktop or laptop. Right click on your certificate. Next click download. Save image. Or at the top right corner, there is a share icon. Click on it. Next click download image. Or if you are going to download from mobile at the top right corner, there is a share icon. Click on it. Next, click download image. That you could find that at https eduigp.com, the diploma certificate image version. You have to download it from your from our website. That is www.eduigp.com. 
Okay, Institute of Global Professionals ITP celebration time with your new achievement. Here, okay, certification process. Certification process step by step. Step one, September 25, that is today's program name, learning across math, social studies, and assessment certification with www.eduitp.com okay please collect your e-certificate right away okay do we have the certification code sir Dear knowledge seekers, from the bottom of my heart, I would like to thank all of you for attending today's session. Hopefully, hopefully you have gained something new today and you will apply the things that you have learned in your life. If you think that you have learned something from us we, or we have been helpful to you, even just a little bit, please leave a, a review of today's webinar. And please recommend our page to your friends. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe to our Facebook group, Facebook page, and also to our YouTube channel. Okay, then today's program name, we have the certificate certification link. Today is September 25. Certification link now available in the comment box and pinned comments. Certification link will be available always in this program post. Facebook page, Facebook group, and YouTube channel description. Okay, that is www.eduidp.com certification process. You can claim your certificate in two ways, directly from comment box or pinned comment, then post description, or if you are not able to click this link, please directly browse www.eduitv.com for all informations together find today's program then the process are the same certification process is step three browse www.eduitv.com or the given link you will get directed in this page of our war website then click and roll now don't forget to click and roll now you could also see this in our youtube link everybody must enroll first before you could claim your certificate if you are new create your account if you have an account then log in directly after that find the seminar title and get enrolled after you enrolled First, you have to log in if you are new to this, if it will be your first time to claim the ES certificate that is at www.eduigp.com. So don't forget to log in. Okay, certification process on of September 25, certification code required is required today's program name name is learning across areas of math social studies and assessment and our code for today is igp0808 without code no one is eligible for certificate but with code you can claim your certificate anytime you may take note, you may screenshot or take note of this code, IGP0808. Because without the code, you cannot get your certificate. Okay, step five. With code, click get your certificate right there you can see the arrow just first you have to input 0808 then click get your certificate our topic is learning across areas of math social studies and assessment then it will be auto downloaded to your device after clicking get your ah, the certificate 
certificate will be shown to you after you click that get your certificate and it will be auto downloaded to you or to your device happy announcement Oh, this is the sample. Your certificate will be ready. That will be the sample of your certificate. And one can verify your certificate with the certificate verification link. Our free international webinar certificates, it is auto-downloadable in PDF file. You don't need to download it manually. So check your device file manager. Sometimes it looks like and completed, which is for your mobile screen size in PDF file, everything is okay. If nothing is found in your file manager, please check your browser setting or update your browser or try with another browser or try it from a laptop. You can join our our all live programs from Facebook, page, Facebook page, Facebook group, YouTube channel, website. If anyone missed any program due to some unavoidable issues, still you can attend previous webinars with verification code, certificate. Our core team members are always ready in comment section to support you to find solution. Team customer service representative, FB page. Charis Abejo Cabiros and Janet Cablao. Team Customer Service Representative in the FB Group. We have Sherilyn Yamaguchi, Jonas Malingin, and Alonso Warren Carriaga. Then Team C Customer Service Representatives in our YouTube channel, Kelvin Linanto, Joel Danaog, and Jeffrey Sayek. On uh, September 26, 2021, we have Learner's Mental Health. That will be in the morning session. Okay, we will have two speakers from the United States. Don't forget Learner's Mental Health. Then evening session, upcoming webinar on September 26, the value of enterprise and entrepreneurship education and we will have three speakers, two from South Africa and one from Scotland. That will be on September 26. On September 27, English Literature and Psychology Role in Education. This will be an evening session. We will have two speakers from Philippines. And another evening session on September. September 28, 2021, Innovative Teaching Strategies, uh, strategies Amidst Pandemic. Two speakers will be from Philippines again. And then evening session, upcoming webinar, September 29, Communication Skills in Teaching and Learning Process. We, have, we will have three speakers, one from Vietnam, one from India, and one from Greece. Upcoming webinar evening session, September 30, Healthy Living Equals Successful Living. We will have two, sp two speakers from Philippines and one from India and one from United States. That is Healthy Living Equals Successful Living, September 30. And then upcoming webinar, October 1, webinar series, Authentic Assessment in Teaching and Learning Part 1. That will be on October 1. We have two speakers from Indonesia and one from Philippines. Authentic Assessment in Teaching and Learning Part 1. Upcoming webinar, October 2. Teaching English as Foreign Language and Assessment, Part 1. That will be on October 2. We have two speakers from Indonesia. Part 1 will be on October 2. Teaching English as Foreign Language and Assessment. And then we have 
morning session, upcoming webinar that will be on October 3. Acing the new normal education. We will have three speakers from Philippines. Acing the new normal. Disaster preparedness and climate change adaptation. Evening session, upcoming webinar, October 3, 2021. And we have, will have three speakers from Philippines. That will be on evening session, October 3, 2021. A very timely topic, disaster preparedness. Authentic assessment in teaching and learning part two will be on October 4 in the evening session. We will have two speakers from Indonesia, one from Indonesia and another from Bangladesh. And then upcoming webinar evening session, comp competency-based teaching. That will be on October 5. One speaker is from Philippines and another is from India. Okay, let's go back to our code for today. That is IGP0808. Today's program name is Learning Across Areas of Math, Social Studies, and Assessment. Today is September 25. Don't You may take a screenshot or take note of the IGP code for today, for the webinar code for today. That is IGP0808. Don't forget to collect your ECP certificate and then give a check in with IGP spread this info information with your friends we hope that you, to see you all again in our next webinar thank you so much stay happy and stay safe once again I am Marbet your host for today signing off bye